Imagine, if you will, you're near the end of a dinner party together with your wife or girlfriend, when one of the guests reaches for the inevitable question. So, how did you two meet? Now, say that you tell the story of some random encounter when a friend of yours dragged you practically against your will to some party he wanted to go. And there, across a crowded room, your eyes caught a glimpse of her. And then you say, I fell in love the moment I looked into her eyes. Stories like these can easily turn out to be the night's highlight. You always run the risk of coming across as a little too romantic, but overall, it will appear you did well. Now, picture something slightly different. Keeping the beginning of the story intact, you now cross the room and approach her, the very woman who's now standing beside you. And answering the same question, you say, I first fell in love with her the moment I saw her breasts. Now, the more, let's say, optimistic are probably going to think that you were joking. But the rest, that you have just embarrassed your partner in front of all the guests. Notice how in reality what you're really saying in both of these cases is that the only reason you got together was love. Something that should leave the details somewhat irrelevant. But unless we wanted to play really dumb, we need to acknowledge that by talking about our lover's breasts rather than eyes, a certain rule was broken. But if so, of what rule book? Well, if that ever happens to you, you might want to spend the rest of the night explaining how love at first sight was developed through the fusion of two Greek ideas, both describing love, eros and agape. My lords, if you would hear a high tale of love and death, so begins one of the greatest love stories the world has known. It's not that of Romeo and Juliet, but one that served as its blueprint, Christian and Isolde, a story that emerged in France around the 12th century and whose echoes can be heard in love stories ever since. It follows the adventures of a young knight, Christian, who falls tragically in love with a woman that was promised to his lord, King Mark of Cornwall. Stories like these began to emerge in France when local legends initially meant to commemorate war deeds were suddenly changed to focus on the intimate and often tragic affairs of knights and the ladies of their heart. The exact reason for why this happened remains unclear, but Europe's 12th century was not just another date. It was a cauldron of cultural change that saw the beginnings of the first crusades and the buildings of the great cathedrals. And just as the last stones on Notre Dame were being carefully placed in Paris, in the south of France, a special tribe of wandering poets, the troubadours, began to rework the Celtic legends they had inherited from the north. Legends like that of King Arthur and his brave knights turning the focus from war to love and from Arthur's courageous battles to the treacherous love affair between his champion knight Lancelot and his dazzling young queen Guinevere. This, however, would be no ordinary kind of love, but one that would change the course of history until it became the only acceptable by the guests back at our dinner party. And just like the plots of their stories, the troubadours synthesized this new love from the best material they had available at the time, the legacy of Greece. See, during the High Middle Ages, two concepts were simultaneously current by way of explaining love, both originally Greek, but now forced against each other due to the pressures of the new faith in Christianity. The first was known as agape, the word that the original Greek-speaking authors of the Holy Gospels chose to describe the love preached by Jesus Christ. It was the love thy neighbor as thyself kind, a love that comes from the heart and is centered in the heart, but one that is strangely impersonal, as a true Christian is never really allowed to choose whom they will love. At the opposite side of that Greek spectrum stood Eros, the love made famous by the lyric poets of ancient Greece. A love that, however spiritual Plato made it sound, was centered in the eyes born out of looking at the beauty of the human form. 
the philosopher Empedocles wrote how of all the organs in the human body, the eyes specifically were created by no other than Aphrodite, goddess of sexual desire, who in accordance with the nature infused them with fire, the fire that was emitted outwards, touching everything the eyes beheld. The theory of vision through emission was current among the Greeks, who believed that a certain fire comes pouring out of our eyes, meeting the objects we behold halfway, where it creates an evolon, an image that accounts for the illusory world we see all around us. So that in a certain way, the Greeks believe that sight is a refined sense of touch. So, Eros and Agape, which comes first? The scholars of medieval Europe argued with no end between the two, wondering whether the eyes or the heart takes precedence in matters of love. But in the south of France, something was brewing. As around the time of the First Crusade, a group of wandering artists, the troubadours, dared to answer in a way that was never before ever conceived. Both, they said, love is born from both the eyes and the heart. While using the military language of his culture, Giraud de Bornel wrote that the eyes are the scouts of the heart and they go on reconnaissance for what would please the heart to possess. And when they are in full accord, all three at one time, perfect love is born from what the eyes have made welcome to the heart. When Tristan's eyes met Isolde's, his noble heart welcoming hers, Eros met Agape and for the first time in history, Aphrodite opened the way for Jesus. The troubadours baptized this way, a more, a third new kind of love, as passionate as Eros and as pure as Agape, and one that is uniquely Western, as this radical invention of the troubadours, and as much as some would insist otherwise, was never to be repeated outside the European continent. And so, to this day, the very word we use to describe this all-encompassing feeling, love, has been secretly inherited not from the Greeks, but from the French, who first synthesized it out of its Greek components. But back in the 12th century of Europe, ideas such as that of Amour were dangerous indeed, because falling in love in an age where marriage was a business deal that involved titles of land and claims to the throne could massively disrupt the social order that was so carefully tuned by the nobility and priesthood alike. In many respects, it was no different to disrupting the oil trade today. And so, the counterculture was developed by the troubadours, who joined the two ends of the Greek love spectrum, weaving it around Celtic myths, infusing them with the faith in Christianity, or at least an effort to pretend one. It has been said that the memorable events in history of great revolutions and terrible wars are but the visible effects of the invisible changes in human thought. It has also been said that for Europe, two were the moments where new thoughts were produced, the epics of Homer and the creation of Amor. And if this is true, then the love of the troubadours conquered not only the noble hearts of Europe, but the entire world we live in today. And what started as an underground movement of medieval poets has become an idea as powerful as the great ideologies that emerged during the world wars. Whenever we speak of love at first sight, a meeting of souls, whenever we say that new love conquers old, we unknowingly play in a table set by those first poets a thousand years before.